let's start kicking off here. Um, for those of you joining us this afternoon, my name is Elise Hobson and I'm the venture partner at HX Venture Fund. I hope you guys have gotten a little bit of a caffeine refill um, because this is going to be a very relevant topic to Houston. As Charles Tate just said, um, we are becoming the energy transformation uh, transition capital of the world. And so uh, this topic will be focusing around revolutionizing the energy transition. And please join me in welcoming our very dynamic panel this afternoon. Uh, moderating uh, will be Ron Haddock, Vice President of Strategic Planning and M&A Transactions at Lyondell Bissell, um, an HX Venture Fund Limited partner and a $40 billion chemical company here in Houston, a major investor in the energy transition and circular economy. They engage in venture capital as a means to get forward visibility of interest to their strategy. Alongside Ron is Trevor Best, the co-founder and CEO of Syzygy Plasmonics. It's a company com that's commercializing technology out of Rice University, focusing on the electrification of chemical manufacturing process. Syzygy has just recently completed their Series B round and grown from two to 70 employees, just signing their first commercial contract to decarbonize Korea. Next, we have Gaurav Chakrabarti, co-founder and CEO of Solugen, a Houston-based company that is decarbonizing chemicals and chemical manufacturing. Solugen was just founded in 2017 and has already closed their Series D round, currently standing at a valuation of approximately $3 billion, making them one of Houston's unicorns. And last, but of course not least, Jim Kim, general partner of Builders VC. Jim has been in VC for over a decade, having started his career building out the team at GE Ventures um, and going on to be the general partner of Coastal Ventures and founder of Formation 8 before founding Builders VC. He's soon seen numerous successful exits, such as Motive Drilling, Bolt Threads, and Fieldwire, amongst many others. Um, please join me in welcoming this very dynamic panel this afternoon. Thank you, Elise. Uh, it's indeed a, an honor to be on the stage here with two distinguished entrepreneurs and a seasoned and proven venture capitalist. Um, I'm going to make a few introductory remarks here to set the stage, and then we'll go on into the questions. If you look at the title of this session, Revolutionizing the Energy Transition, that's a pretty bold ambition. So we've got, uh, we've got a lot to, uh, to prove on the stage here in the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, Charles Tate set the stage uh, quite nicely, actually, in the last session, where he posited that at some point in the future, the energy transition coming out of Houston could be a bigger economy than Silicon Valley. Uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty high bar. Um, and yet, if you look at energy transitions and the amount of time it takes, you know, the author, Vaclav Smil, who's probably the best-known writer on the topic, has written over 40 books, 500 articles, uh, Bill Gates cites him as his favorite author because he's so deep on the topic, would tell you that energy transitions take at least a half a century and that on average they've taken over 70 years. And this is going back in the historical record from biomass and to coal and to early petrochemicals, oil, natural gas, hydropower, wind, solar, and now hydrogen. Uh, the reality is energy transitions in fact take a lot of time. And the reason for that is because they're difficult, right? They've got to substitute existing technologies. Uh, there's a lot of capital built up. Today we have trillions of dollars invested in the existing technologies of energy. And so it takes massive upheavals and companies uh, that are actually able to do that to get these en energy transitions to happen. So revolutionizing is in fact a, a pretty bold statement to make, but that's what we're up here to talk about. Uh, to make it uh, a little bit more complex still, and perhaps in complexity comes the opportunity, you look at the events of the last couple of years, whether it's COVID that's had a dramatic oscillating effect on GDPs. If you look at globalization that's been moving in reverse and supply chains having to rebalance, in particular given the crisis that we have in the Ukraine right now and the impact on economies everywhere, you realize we're at a very interesting juncture of history and yet it's precisely at these times where you have crisis, where you have opportunity. 
And so, uh, with that as kind of a context, I'd be interested in uh, the perspectives, and we'll, we'll start first with uh, Trevor and Gaurav, and then we'll come back to Jim, how he thinks of it as an investor. But uh, Trevor, perhaps the first question to you. When you look to get into this broad sector of energy transition with the specific focus uh, more on the chemical side, how did you pick your spots knowing that you had all this opportunity and complexity to deal with? How did you go about doing it? And when you say uh, pick, pick our spots, do you mean like starting here in Houston or like the chemical reactions? Well, I guess it would be uh, the place to play in the industry itself. And then, of course, Houston is part of that. Yeah, so a uh, little background on Syzygy. We're making a new type of chemical reactor. Uh, long story short, we can help to electrify uh, chemical manufacturing platform technology. We're applying it to hydrogen production first and then CO2 utilization. Uh, our technology came out of Rice University. And so when we were starting the company, obviously, you know, technology born and raised here in Houston, we're very interested in uh, keeping that going. Uh, but more than just like having roots here, uh, we did look at the customer base. And when you're looking at, you know, energy transition technologies that play with CO2 utilization, hydrogen, there really is no better place to be than Houston. The Gulf Coast here is, uh, you know, an epicenter for energy, not just for the United States, but, but for the world. And so it makes a lot of sense that the energy transition starts here. We were looking at the customer base, we were looking at the talent base, uh, we were looking at our ability to access different levels of capital over time. And uh, a lot of the arrows pointed us to just stay right here. So it was a pretty easy decision for us. So a lot of factors on the demand and supply side that make it kind of a natural place to innovate. Uh, and Gaurav, how about you? What were, what were the things that you looked at when you found this opportunity that ultimately has led you to create one of the unicorns present here today? Yeah, I think when you look at Cellusion, what we do is we marry biology with traditional petrochemistry processing, right? Everyone demonizes petrochemistry, but it works, right? It's been around for hundreds of years. It scales up and it produces products at the right price potentially has, you know, sustainability issues, but that's where biology can come in. What if you can marry biology with the, the throughput and scale that you find with uh, traditional petrochem? And all of a sudden, we can create a best of both worlds approach. You don't have to sacrifice on cost. You don't have to sacrifice on sustainability to have the scale that you want. So if you look at Solugen, we're a group of biologists. We're a group of chemical engineers. And we're a group of effectively construction workers, right? What we do is we, we build plants. We're plumbers, right? And when we look at Houston, those are the three confluences that have been so powerful here. So we've got the ability through the medical center to have biology to come in here to do en enzyme engineering, some of the best in the world, mind you. Uh, we have the Petro, 25% of the world's chemical engineers are, are here in Houston and, and, and surrounding areas. But then you've got the actual ability to execute. This, this is the part of the equation that no other coast will ever have, is you can have the ideas and you can have these things, but unless you can show that you can take something from start to finish, um, it's difficult to, to make the argument that you can build a, a giant business. And I think Houston is uniquely uh, suited for those three uh, studies. And. Uh Jim, we talked earlier about the role of Builders VC where you look at platform type companies as opposed to kind of singular opportunities. And, you know, with your long history of being a VC investor starting actually at General Electric and then uh, Silicon Valley, what do you see as the platform type investment opportunities in this energy and uh, chemicals transition, decarbonization? What, what does a platform look like? Yeah, so... Um in general, platform, we would rather be investing in the goose that is laying the golden egg versus just investing in the golden egg because you could crack it open and there'd be nothing there, right? So you prefer to invest in a technology play that has the ability to spin out multiple products, multiple shots on gold. Um, and, and, and you need that in this space, right? This is a very, very difficult space to invest. A lot of lumps. I was you know, very heavily involved in clean tech 1.0 and... Uh, made a number of investments and we just lost our shirts. Um, and, and when you think about, you know, this is the mother of all markets, right? It, it is the largest market out there. 
Uh, but when you're looking at it from a venture capital perspective, you're always thinking about risk, right? You're thinking about technology risk, execution risk, finance risk, regulatory risk, leadership risk, customer risk. Fortunately, in the energy space, you're 100% sure that if you produce it, right, somebody's going to buy it. So, so from the, from the you know, risk of, of a customer market risk perspective, that's really not existent. But all of the other elements are present in spades, right? And so as an investor, you're thinking about how do I mitigate these risks? Well, one of the ways I mitigate the risk is investing in a technology that is a platform play, okay? And then I have multiple shots on goal. Another way you, inv you invest and in, in get comfortable with risk is the best way that I know how to mitigate risk is with great people, right? Solving the big problem, right? If there's a technology risk, you bring in the best people in the world to solve that technology risk. Um, and that's why I think Houston is really exciting. You know, for this, for this industry vertical, uh, this should be, you know, home base because you have great chemical engineers, you have understanding of commodity markets, you have financial players, you have corporate partners. Mm -hmm. The whole recipe is here. You're not gonna solve this industry as we found out in Cleantech 1.0. You don't solve this industry from Berkeley or Stanford. I'm sorry you don't, right? Like maybe I get yelled at for saying that, but you're gonna solve it here because the understanding of the industry and the understanding of the customer base and how products are used, that's all here along with the talent. And uh, as I think about it as the, as the corporate guy up here, I'm one of the few corporates I think that's represented here on the panel. As we look out to the chemicals industry of the future and energy, you know, what certainly strikes us about Houston and maybe one or two other places on the world is that we have these deep natural advantages that we call the feedstock advantage, whether it's the, uh, whether it's the supply or the cost of extraction of oil and natural gas or, or otherwise. You know, Saudi Arabia would be one of the other places where you'd have similar type of features. And so as you look at this energy transition and kind of the quote unquote long goodbye to oil, which could go well into the latter part of the century, kind of the last men standing, so to speak, are gonna be the Middle East and it's gonna be Houston. And so it naturally favors this ecosystem uh, over the long term. Uh, with all of the you know, recent disruptions that you've seen in the market, you know, earlier Gwyneth had, had commented on, you know, we're in the recession and it sucks, right? Kind of a difficult environment. Are you seeing similar types of pressure or is the energy and chemicals industry different just given the long-term strong position that we actually have in terms of fundraising and uh, attracting investments into your company? And Jim, maybe back to you first on this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um Valuations across the board, when you, know, you look at uh, public company valuations, they're down 30, 40% across technology, right? So that's now filtered into Series A and Series B. It's come all the way down. Um, so we were previously looking at companies with a million ARR that were saying, all right, I'm going to raise software companies. You know, I'm going to raise that 150 million pre. And we're like, that, that, there's no sanity, right? <laughs> in that, that model doesn't work. Uh, so we sat on our hands for a little bit and, and, and you know, shifted where we were investing. Um, uh, so in tech, that's largely come back to earth. It's interesting, though. The one sector of tech where valuations still are, are propped up and high um, is, is the area of decarbonization. Uh, and I think the number of funds that have been created to address this issue um, is, is tremendous, right? You, you see uh, some traditional oil and gas players like Riverstone, you know, now a billion dollar decarbonization fund. Wellington, billion dollar decarbonization fund. Um, where are they gonna put their money, right? They, if you read their investment prospectus, they're looking for companies that have real revenue. Because again, in this sector, you actually have to produce stuff, right? But they're looking for companies that uh, have solved product market fit, have real revenue, and they could put meaningful dollars to work. Uh, and so the number is supply demand. The number of those companies that, that actually are in existence, one's here, right? They're, they're, they're not too many of them. So for that reason, uh, companies in this space continue to have valuations that are um, aggressive and a bit outsized. You know? And, and then for, from that perspective as an entrepreneur, it's a great place to be because you're putting steel into the ground in a lot of cases, unless you're a capital efficient model and you're taking advantage of, of the infrastructure that's already out there. Um, 
but this is a space where money is, is, is needed to, to expand and grow. So I think that's a good thing. So if you're in decarbonization or plastic recycling, it's not a down round. Is it an up round at this stage? Yeah, we just did our Series D at a significant up round. Uh, but I, I think, I have this phrase, uh, free cash flow is freedom. So yes, we could live in a world where valuations are high, valuations are low, but if you have a clear path to how your business, not just revenue, free cash flow, right? Not even a free cash flow. That means the, the cash that is going back into the pockets of my employees and me so that I can continue to de develop this business. So yes, valuations are still maintained here because you also have to think about what valuation comes with the word value. What, what is the value of existing on Earth for another 100 years? I'd argue that it's worth a lot. And so the valuation story here needs to be married to the real world. What is the free cash flow potential of the business? Because there could be a world where that free cash flow is going to be so big that the valuation ju is justified uh, today. Yeah, and uh, w when I think about this, I like to think about uh, supply and demand. And uh, historically, after Cleantech 1.0, there was uh, not a whole lot of demand for Cleantech for a couple years, which made the supply of quality startups is very, very competitive for startups to get funding for a few years. And so suddenly there has been a resurgence of demand for Cleantech and there is a lack of supply of quality companies. Uh, which is driving up valuations. Uh, we, we talked about pressure earlier. There's also a very significant uh, pressure on the whole market in, in energy that isn't really present in other markets like software or, or healthcare. And uh, that is like what is happening to the climate. You know, the planet is now annually catching on fire. Uh, if you see what's happening in Pakistan right now, the, the evidence that this is happening is just growing every single year, which is mounting pressure from the public, it's mounting pressure from the government on all these big energy and chemical companies to change, which is pushing them to go out and acquire new technologies, which is pushing them to invest. Investors are seeing this, which is growing their demand for clean tech. And uh, there is a uh, short supply of really quality clean tech companies to invest in in relation to the market. There will be a correction, I think, at some point, as, as you see more clean tech companies hit the space. But right now, uh, we are in a period where uh, clean tech companies are getting pretty high valuations. Uh, I think as those companies bring tech to market, they can grow into those valuations. And mm -hmm. this comes into like entering the public markets and the demand from the public for these kinds of companies. There aren't very many clean tech companies on the market, and the ones that are like Tesla are fetching a huge premium right now. Uh, not gonna comment on what might happen to that over time as more options become available, but uh, there's definitely a high demand for clean tech at the moment. The, uh, the recent Inflation Reduction Act, uh, IRA it's called, with 369 billion that is being targeted on climate-related investments. The Economist calls it the vote heard around the world. I'm curious, um, and Jim, maybe this is a, a question for you. What impact have you seen, if any, thus far from this uh, fairly significant piece of legislation? Um, I think it's early days. I, I would say the, the personal impact, uh, I, I decided to replace my furnace with a heat pump, right? And so you're gonna get <laughs> government incentives to do that. Uh, I sit down with my HVAC guy, he's like, I have no idea how much money you're going to get. <laughs> I have no idea what it's going to be, a rebate, a tax credit, what it's going to be. Um, so I think they're still in the early days of figuring out the actual details of, of how it's going to work. Um, that being said, when you look at things like the ITC, right, which, which got renewed to 2034 or something like that, th these things work. You know, the solar industry exists because of the German feed-in tariff. So you, you, can't, you can't look at this and say there's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna be meaningful, meaningfully impactful to the industry, because it will be. Um, now, as investors, how do you play that, right? How do you invest in that, in that environment? Uh, that, that's one thing. And the second thing that we still need to figure out is the details of, of how it's gonna be spent. I mean, I, I'd argue one of the biggest problems that um, startup companies face in this sector is, is uh, scaling, right? So if, 
if I were the one with the, uh, with the pen there, I would, I would be providing loan guarantees, project financing for you guys, right? I mean, that just makes sense because you're not able to go to the traditional project finance banks and get money, you know, 70% debt to put steel into the ground, right? Not when you're scaling. I mean, at this point, you probably are able to. But for other folks, scaling from that pilot facility to the next facility to the next facility, there's technical risk. So I, I think, you know, details are still to be determined there, but I'm hopeful that uh, somebody with half a brain will actually, you know, uh, identify this problem needs to be scaled with, uh, needs to be solved with, with helping address scaling risk, and I think you do that with dollars. The regulation certainly matters, and being in the right place, right, geographic advantage or geologic advantages uh, certainly make, uh, make a difference for op opportunities to, you know, create companies. Uh, in the lead up to today, uh, Gaurav, we had had a previous conversation and you identified that you think that perhaps the next trillion dollar company could actually come out of this Houston ecosystem. And yet at the same time, we've talked about some of the challenges and we heard about some of the challenges and what needs to uh, change or improvements that could be made to actually foster that in Houston. What, what are your thoughts on Houston as the center where this trillion dollar could come from and what's well, some of the gonna constraints be his are? Well, it's going to be Very exciting. Uh, no, I think we need to take a step back, uh, back to your IRA, the era, era question. There's something remarkable happening with the era, and it's two things. It's something called tax equity, and then the other one is called 48C. Um, tax equity structures are ways that corporations that have profits uh, can defray the costs of the taxes against those profits. In the uh, era, the IRA, we now have the ability to pitch to customers that if we have a decarbonization pass with them, they can get a tax equity benefit and actually allows them to save money on their taxes, which I'm told is important. The second uh, is something called 48C. 48C is a provision that allows you to get uh, assets that are quote unquote heavy in carbon and retrofit with whatever technology you have and you get 40% of the capex of that asset back to you, uh, again, in this tax equity structure. So imagine, all of a sudden, all of my CapEx deployment in Houston, which has a lot of sites that I can retrofit, mm -hmm. I can outpay 60% of LTV against that asset, meaning 40% is covered almost as a subsidy, and I leverage the other 60% at a 50% LTV. Now I'm only paying 30% you know, 30 on an asset that should have been uh, you know, 100 million bucks, I'm paying 30 million bucks. That's a big deal. Um, and I think that's what's going to allow Houston to really move fast. It's a pretty technical detail, but I think that the devil's always in the details, and it's that detail that I think if we're smart in Houston, we can really pick up on that 48C provision. So policy clearly matters. Trevor, your company has recently done a deal uh, that's been publicly announced in Korea, and the company has expanded. Korea versus Houston. What it, what are your thoughts? So uh, when we're talking about overall potential, uh, I'm really excited about Houston, the Houston economy. I do think that there is the potential for a trillion dollar energy transition company to come out of this city. Uh, it, to the note that that's going to be Syzygy, you know, if we, we're a couple billion behind in valuation to Guarov, and if we can just catch Together up. Together we can make it up. Yeah, I'd be super <laughs> happy. Uh, but uh, Houston has been slower to move than some other areas. If I'm being honest, uh, we now have multiple field trials and none of them are going in the ground in and around uh, the Gulf Coast. Uh, I am excited about the long-term potential here and I think that the IRA will help you know, incentivize some people to move earlier. But uh, I will say in South Korea, we have seen a cohesion between uh, government and corporations that uh, we have not yet seen in North America. And so we're hoping that uh, seeing things like what is happening in Korea with, with Syzygy and others will spur more in Houston to action. Uh, I think there was a, a period post COVID where everybody was reorienting and trying to decide what to do next. We're starting to see more forward movement, but we need to see even more from the corporates in and around this area if we're really going to realize Houston's true potential over the next decade. 
More for the corporate. Sounds like a message for, for me. Uh, I didn't do much of an introduction uh, at the beginning. I'm from uh, Lion Del Bazel, and I'm responsible for the strategic direction of the company and mergers and acquisitions, and we also do venture investing. Uh, and I can, t I can certainly confirm that decarbonization and plastic recycling are absolutely at the top of the agenda. Um, a question, what would it take for VCs to be more interested or to actually channel more funds? What would you need, Jim, to see in the corporates or in startups here to make it more of a destination? I think from, from a venture perspective, we're, we're not in the business of altruism, unless you're an impact-focused fund. So first and foremost, we exist for our limited partners uh, to generate a financial return. So um, if we are able to have an example success, I mean, VCs tend to be lemmings. You know, you have one success, everybody follows, right? So um, let's build a, a you know, let, let's start out smaller. You know, a company worth tens of billions of dollars here, make it successful in this sector, and then money will flow in, people, people will come. So I, I think that, that's one thing that I think would be, um, ultimately, can you really control that? You know, maybe, maybe not, but uh, certainly supporting entrepreneurs to actually go and, and build that company with the vision of building a company that big, not saying, I'm going to sell my company for $100 million, and, and that's a nice outcome. Um, let's go for it. From, but I think that's the exciting part of like this generation or you know this cycle of excitement is like the people that go into climate tech they don't necessarily go into it because they want to make a quick buck they're they're going to grind it out towards the end they're mission driven they're mission driven yeah, yeah. which is actually what you want in VC right yeah. you want a founder or a group of founders that are just going to keep going no matter how hot it gets outside and it gets pretty hot here and just keep keep making progress despite having offers on the table to buy the business out. So that's why I'm convinced you have the right mission-driven founders in an industry that can actually be a trillion dollar mm -hmm. you know, market, then why can't it be Houston? And Gaurav, you've described your own path as being mission-driven and you've just uh, done a funding round, yes. a unicorn with a $3 billion valuation. What's the pressure really like? What's it really like to be in that role? <laughs> Where's my wife? No, you make um, it sound easy. So it, it's, uh, I, I think Trevor and I were talking about this, where it's like every, everything is sequenced out, right? I think for us, the, at Solution at least, the, the pressure was massive initially uh, because uh, me and my co-founder, Sean Hunt, were exceptional type A's. That's just how we are. Um, and we knew that if we failed, everything, you know, our whole entire legacy would be, you know, it was very extreme, let's be honest. Like, and when I look back at it, I feel like the thing that we should have been doing has been more compassionate towards ourselves and been like, it's okay. It's okay if it doesn't work out because you're going to learn something and you're going to contribute to society in some way. Today, in terms of pressure, um, I feel no pressure. Uh, yes, I mean, I, there's a lot of people wanting us to do stuff, but like, my goal is just to build an amazing business that goes after the climate crisis. And I don't need investors to try to tell me what to do when I know exactly the things that we need to do to get there. So I have zero pressure now. But back then, I was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and Trevor, yeah. mission driven, or you saw an opportunity that the company you were in wasn't set about solving? Yeah, so uh, I absolutely am mission driven. Uh, I used to you know, work in the oil and gas industry, and I would read about like, these reports coming out from the International Panel on Climate Change, and I decided that I wanted to be on the right side of history, and uh, I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to this fight. And uh, we went looking for a technology. We found something truly incredible. And uh, we have been advancing it at a speed that is almost unheard of. Uh, you know, I recognize that our technology, we can get into that some other time. Feel free to come ask me about it. It's pretty wild. Uh, it is something unique and wonderful in the time of humanity's greatest need. But there's only so much that we can do. And so. I'm actually kind of where Kowarov is. I don't really feel any pressure. I'm going to do my best. And uh, if, if my best isn't good enough, then you know, no, no skin off my back. Uh, it's going to require a community. It's going to require customers to adopt. It's going to require public and government to support. You know? And if the rest of the world doesn't actually care about the energy transition and it doesn't actually happen and our company fails because of it, 
then, you know, I don't know if there's anything I could do because of that. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to make the best photocatalytic reactor the world has ever seen. And it is going to meaningfully reduce, you know, costs and emissions for our customers. And if that's not enough, I don't know what is. So. And so, uh, Jim, you see, have seen more companies probably than any of us have had. And I'm sure you see a lot of people who are mission driven. Mission driven versus profit uh, driven. What sort of distinctions do you make when you look at founders and where you choose to invest? Well, I, I mean, ultimately companies are people. So it's all about people. Um, and it's all about the, the founder and the leader, uh, the, the person who sets the tone for the organization. And th that is a question, right? There are, there are quite a few wonderful early stage founders who bring the company to 150 million and they get an offer from a uh, large corporate um, who will take them off the table. And that's, that's wonderful, right? And, uh, that doesn't really move the needle though, right? And so what we tend to look for, because ultimately where we're playing at early stage, um, you want to invest in the home run company. You want to invest in the unicorn. You want to be involved early because you're taking the risk when there might only be a, an idea or a prototype that needs scaling. Uh, you want to make sure that you're aligned with the founder and potentially they're going to go for it and build that multi-trillion dollar business, hopefully. Um, but, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what you sit across the table during dinner and you say, where, where are you? you know, what is a good outcome for you, yeah. right? Well, that's why I think bo both almost necessarily have to be true, right? Where it's like, but, but the sequencing is very important. So it, it, you have to be driven by, you know, some, especially in this game, and how long you have to play. Climate, right? But you also have to appreciate that the only way to keep playing that game is to make profit. So, right. like, if you really care about changing the climate, make profit along the way so you can keep funding yourselves. Something that, that I've, like, grappled with and eventually come to terms with before I started the company was uh, there is no impact without returns. And it mm. doesn't necessarily, like, feel great from, like, a story standpoint, but it is the damn truth. And uh, if you can't give great returns, no one in will invest in you. And if no one's investing in you, you can't grow and have impact. So uh, it's important to not get those mixed up. <laughs> Capitalism is at finest. Yeah. We're going to pivot now to questions from the audience. Uh, the first, you know, it's interesting. Uh, before we came up here on stage, we talked about how different this would be than digital or the types of innovations that have come out of Silicon Valley and how the energy transition was really about hard things, physical things. So interestingly, the very first question we get here is a software and data center question, but let's go ahead and play it, and, and one of you, uh, please take it. So the question here is, how are you validating the data on the efficacy of investments on green initiatives, including decarbonization, and how can software or other technologies there play a role in the end? A transition from that perspective. Um, that's that's a tough one because right now, and, and we're actually looking at this. The the idea of validating a carbon savings or validating carbon that gets put back into the soil, that's still a little bit of the wild wild west. So when it comes to actually validating uh, the environmental impact of a technology. Um, a large, a large part of it's relying on the entrepreneur. We'll actually go as well and hire industry experts because, you know, I'm 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 not a PhD in you know environmental studies or or, or agriculture or whatever it might be uh, to be able to validate the carbon savings is actually there. So there's the is it technically possible right <laughs> from from that perspective? Um, and then it will be bringing in experts who really understand it. But that that question is interesting because it is a huge problem right now. There are a lot of big claims out there, right? My agriculture technology will save 40% you know, carbon relative to the traditional processes. I don't know, right? We, can you prove it? No, we don't have any studies yet. There, there, there isn't a validating body yet to, right. to stamp that and say this is actually true. So it's a bit of the wild west. We'll, we'll but, see. And, and I think it's, it's not just carbon, right? I, I think a lot of people immediately focus. It's such an easy thing, right? Oh, we're going to measure the carbon emissions. but. Mm -hmm. 
ESG, it, environmental is one third of it. The other two are social and governance, right? How do we think about how your solution is impacting the community? Meaning, are you making it easier for people to get jobs in the community that otherwise wouldn't have been able to do that? That is very important. On top of that, what's the waste streams? How are the downstream effects on local eco, e ecotoxicity? These things, while it may not be easy to quantify, will actually become a more holistic way of looking at uh, sustainability impact. It's not just capital E environment. Yeah. And uh, to, to quickly weigh in on this, uh, both of these notes are very true. Syzygy recently just uh, created a position for uh, Director of Sustainability, or pardon me, VP of Sustainability and Corporate Social Responsibility. And uh, it's because we're seeing a huge shift in the industry towards like overall ESG, that SG port part being very important. And on the carbon piece, uh, it is the Wild West, but it's actually not very difficult to figure out how many emissions go into the atmosphere. Uh, the problem is lobbying. And uh, the <laughs> different frameworks are so heavily lobbied in different parts of the world. Uh, we have tried to cut through the clutter. We've actually released a tool. If you go to www.carbonmodel.com, you can see our life cycle assessment. Uh, it allows you to adapt things, and you can look at things from the U.S. government point of view, which is the Argonne National Labs GREET model. You can also calculate things for the International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, just as a note, if you use the European methodology or the IPC methodology or the U.S. methodology, you get wildly different numbers. So some things that look incredibly green and will be getting tons of credits in the U.S. would not qualify in other regulatory regimes. And the harmonization of that is probably the single biggest thing facing planet Earth right now, I think. Mm. And most, a lot of entities are fighting getting to true numbers. It's uh, going to be interesting in the next couple of years. We've got... Uh a very specific question here that comes from Adam Stokes. Uh, and the question is, to what extent do you think that robotics will play an important role in energy transition? Anyone want to take that? This is such a broad world of robotics. Um, I think I'll just be very simple with ours. We use robots in our lab to automate stuff. Um, but I'm not sh I don't think that's what the question's getting at. Yeah, I don't know if it will play a big role in energy transition. Like, you could talk about automation, and uh, as we go to, like, you know, automated 18-wheelers transporting things, those 18-wheelers still need fuel. I don't know how much, you know, whether or not it's a person or a machine controlling it impacts the overall life cycle, like carbon intensity of the process. So uh, I, I think they're tangential, you know, uh, robots could help with, you know, reducing production costs, which could help increase adoption, but I don't know if it's like a direct tie-in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we've invested in a company called Safe AI, and they are uh, electrifying and, and automating um, mining vehicles. So those gigantic CAT 757, dump trucks that are going around a, a mine, um, they're bringing technology to that. And you know, they're replacing six or seven workers. Why mines are adopting that technology has little to do with carbon benefit. It's more to do with just, hey, I'm replacing six workers, mm -hmm. right? And um, they, get, they get paid handsomely for that. So I, I do think it's a, uh, it, it might help in, as you said, in the production, right? Um, overall life cycle, but as far as, uh, yeah, it's really going to be science, right? We're, we're making electrons, we're making hydrocarbons. That, robots aren't going to make those, right? It's going to be the science of, of uh, you know, what, what you guys are yeah. developing. Yeah. And like uh, automation, machine learning, things like that can help to optimize processes, but I, not quite robotics. Yeah, I would say uh, from the chemical industry perspective, we have a lot of production sites and assisted machine learning, robotics, automation, controls, kind of that whole gamut are, are all highly relevant for further improving efficiency, which of course is what you do in downtimes, right? You focus on making your operations more effective and small percentages on huge volumes uh, really does make a difference. Let's take uh, one more question. Uh, and this is a question, Trevor, to you and Gaurav, and we've got about two minutes. How did you select your VC partners? What did you look for? Uh, so, fantastic question. 
uh, we were actually looking for people like us, uh, someone who has a mission-driven component. It's not just money. They needed to really, or we needed them to really want to change the world in a positive way so that uh, it's not just money. Double bottom line is a good way to think about it, looking for good people. And beyond that, like standard, uh, you know, what kind of connections uh, do they have? You know, what is their reach? Can they invest later? All those things. But first gate was, do they have a double bottom line? Is it more than just money? Yeah, in the early years, this is going to sound bizarre, but I'm going to say it because you guys should use it. Uh, we would fabricate crises and see which investors would help us. So we would say, hey, the plant went down. We, we need this valve. We don't know where to get it. How are we going to get it? And three investors said, I know exactly where to get it. And now they sit on our board for the last five years. Um, that's how we decided who should be on the board. Yeah. We've got room for time for one more question. This is a question on, are we in a bubble for uh, technologies related to climate transition? Are we in a bubble? I talked earlier about the uh, supply demand gap, and I do think there might be a valuation correction at some point in the future, but I think the demand for clean tech is very real, and there's, we're not in a bubble for the product, but we may be in a bubble for valuations. Who cares if we're in a bubble? I mean, like, the reality is, like, the, we're building stuff that, that's, that's going to make the longevity of, of Earth better. So, fine, if we're in a bubble, we might discover some really cool technology in the process. There's a shortage of uh, opportunities to invest in right now. I mean, I can tell you from the corporate side, looking, I mean, in particular in recycling, which is something that is very, very close to a chemicals company that uh, has downstream plastics. I mean, this is an area that will, that should ultimately be a huge percentage of everything we produce coming from recycled plastics, and there just aren't enough investment opportunities. So it's, it, valuations, of course, is the other side of that. Valuations are very high for what little there is out there. Call this maybe a, a, a call out to the venture community to create more companies for us to invest in. <laughs> I, I, I'll just quickly conclude. I, I think we're fundamental, having lived through Clean Tech 1.0 and have a lot of scars on my back as a result, we're fundamentally in a different place. There were science experiments getting funded with hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars to go build plants when there was no proof that they could scale. And I think we're in a fundamentally different place because the people who are getting funding actually have validated science and validated product. So um, I would say, yeah, it's a little frothy or a little heated, but from that perspective, gigantic market opportunity. So start companies, you know, this is a great place to be. Start companies. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. We've, this is exactly the model that, that we're working on here at HX Venture Fund. Um, and it's exactly this kind of connection that we think a re, at HX Venture Fund is going to really take Houston to the next level. When you have, uh, you know, $40 billion corporations in our backyard and the talent of the likes of Ron leading that effort as they build into Landel Bazell innovative companies, local Houston entrepreneurs here that can connect live, you know, in, in the same neighborhood with uh, the entrepreneurs with the talent of Garab and Trevor, it's phenomenal. And then we can attract, because of that, VCs like Jim, who are changing the world every day, 100 companies at a time, um, and bring them here. So he flew in from San Francisco to join us on the stage today to talk to you guys today. I'm deeply grateful for your time and attention to our ecosystem as well. So thank you all very much. Before we clap, we're going to clap up two seconds because we've got a 20 minute break coming up and I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up um, because I know everyone's had quite a long day but there's a phenomenal amount still to come. Again, not a conversation in Houston without that conversation of the future of healthcare where the CEO of MD Anderson, Dr. Pisters, is going to uh, join us in a conversation along with the founding partners of Rise of the Rest who flew in from DC. 5 a.m. flew in from Boston to have that conversation alongside our very own Paul Cherikuri, the very recently announced uh, VIP of Rice University. 
Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about mobility tech, land, sea, and air. So everything from, you know, NASA's former chief technologist, uh, Douglas Terrier, will moderate the conversation with Houston's very own Nick Radford of Nauticus Robotics. And then um, two phenomenal VCs, Adam Sharkawi flew to Boston, from Boston to be here, the co-founder of Material Impact, and also Tess Hatch, a phenomenal female aerospace venture capitalist from Bessemer Venture Partners, who we mentioned earlier as well. So please join us for that as well here. But first of all, well-deserved 15-minute break, and thank you again to our panel.